So I said uh, yesterday I'll figure something out to uh, get a lifted uh, jet and I, I uh, took, actually took the burner back to my hotel room and uh, I almost burned the whole hotel and uh, my fingers also. So I couldn't really figure anything out with, with the stuff I had. But um, I had one nozzle which was way too small so I could get a lifted flame but it was still laminar. And then and the other nozzles, they were too large and, and then the... I couldn't close it, so the gas was all over the place, and then always uh, there was a big, uh, not explosion, but you see, you see the point. So anyway, so I, I, well, maybe we don't need it. Uh, you, you can just imagine how it looks like. Okay, so, so that we just said is the level set equation that describes the flame dynamics of an infinitely thin flame. And uh, here, with, um, with a modification of the burning velocity, uh, local burning velocity with the, um, uh, by curvature and strain. And this equation here, actually, it doesn't say it has to be laminar. We didn't say anything about laminar. Uh, this describes a turbulent flame, but, but in kind of in the DNS limit um, where we have, um, where everything is nicely resolved. So in the thin reaction zones regime, the um, uh, flame is not infinitely thin. The, 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 we said the preheat region actually is much thicker, it's, it's um, uh, uh, by turbulent mixing and so on, so how do we define that? And um, I, think, I think I need to speed up a little bit. Uh, this, is the last, this is the last hour now, right? So, right, so I speed, need to speed up a little bit and we will, um, uh, you know, just uh, not, not talk about all the little details. But the general, I want to give you the general idea. The general idea is that instead of saying the level set represents the flame, we say the level set represents just a temperature isosurface. That's it. Temperature isosurface, which temperature isosurface should we choose? Um, the most important temperature is the inner layer temperature. So we say the, the level set, we want to derive a level set equation that represents the isosurface of uh, T equal to T naught. So to do that, we start out with a temperature equation. We um, uh, write the su substantial derivative here of the temperature uh, at, at, the, uh, at this point. So we want to get the rate of change of the temperature at a point that moves with this isosurface. That, of course, has to be equal to zero. And then um, here, again, we get this uh, dx dt. dx dt, again, here is associated with a, um, with a displacement speed of that front. And now, in, in contrast to what we did before, uh, turns out, if, if you look at a, a scalar, a diffusive scalar, um, and you have a certain profile, you define the front, you can analytically uh, get an expression for the displacement of that front by, by um, diffusion, okay? So, so that, that is shown here. So this is the displacement you get by diffusion and reaction. So uh, you say it like this. So let's say I have um, a diffusive scalar, looks like this, and I let it sit for a while, then it will look like this. Okay, by diffusion. So if I track an isosurface of this temperature, then you see it moved from here to here. Okay, and now if I have uh, chemical reactions, maybe a little later it will look like this again, you know, because this reacted and then this here moved, uh, you know, again to another place. So, so you get a di displacement by diffusion um, or heat conduction here in this, in, uh, in this case and reaction, and this is the displacement speed. So I can just um, plug this in. Um, the normal vector here, we express it again here by the, uh, by the, by the uh, gradient of the, uh, at the isosurface we're looking at. So I can plug this in here. I call this T naught here, I call it G naught, and then I have a level set function that describes this uh, isosurface. Um, the, uh, I can split this up, here this is the diffusion term. I can split this up into two contributions. One is the normal diffusion, diffusion normal to the front, and the other one is um, 
So if I have diffusion at this, at this point here, I, get diff I can split this up in diffusion normal to the front and a diffusion that comes here by curvature that goes along, um, along the isosurface. So this is the, the normal part and this is the curvature part. So um, if I now write these as a, these have dimensions here of a speed, meter per second, if I write this as a speed, then I get a displacement by normal diffusion, I get a displacement by reaction, and I get a displacement by curvature effects, okay? So um, that's interesting because now I can say, well, what is normal diffusion, the effect of normal diffusion plus um, reaction, plus chemistry? That's what we call the premix flame. That's the propagation of a premix flame. That is the interaction of um, normal diffusion and um, chemistry. So we say these two here, uh, we just call these the laminar burning velocity. These must be uh, maybe not exactly the laminar burning velocity, but this must be roughly the laminar burning velocity. And then here I have a second part, which is by curvature. And you see this one, this term here, that looks very similar to what we had before in the corrugated flame regime. But here now, uh, because, the, because the thickness of the flame is finite, uh, here we also get a term that's related to curvature. So now we can, um, so, so this one here was a term that was important in the corrugated flame regime, and here we have a second term. We can try to understand uh, asymptotically which one of these terms is more important, okay? So, so for that, we say, well, what causes the curvature is the, is the turbulence, and, and here we want to look at the highest possible curvature. That would be the, the uh, Kolmogorov scale, that would, um, that would uh, cause that curvature. And so we want to normalize, uh, non-dimensionalize the equation by the, uh, using the Kolmogorov scale. So the time here uses the Kolmogorov time, Kolmogorov scale, Kolmogorov velocity, and so on. So if I, if I do this, I plug this in, this is what I get. Uh, so you see now, this is non-dimensional, this is non-dimensional. So these terms here, maybe that's said here, these terms, all everything that has a star, at the small scales, if I look at it at the small scales, it must be of order one because that's exactly how I non-dimensionalized it, okay? So this is order one, this is order one, this is order one, and uh, for Schmidt number equal to one, this is also one, okay? So the only parameter that appears here is this ratio, okay? So now um, I can try to understand, is this ratio larger or smaller than one? If it's much, much larger than one, this term is not important. If it's much, much smaller than one, then this term actually is not important compared to this. And it turns out, I can write the Karlowitz number. I can write this as u eta square divided by uh, SL square. It's exactly this. So this here is uh, the Karlowitz number <coughs> to the minus one half, okay? So this shows um, in the uh, thin reactions on this regime, See if this is on the next slide. Yeah, uh, so in the thin reaction zones regime, the Karlowitz number is much, much larger than one, which means this one here is very, very small. So in the thin reaction zones regime, this is the leading order term, okay? In the corrugated flame regime, the Karlowitz number is much, much smaller than one. And so this here becomes very large. And then this term here is small compared to the first one, okay? So asymptotically, we see that this one is important in the corrugated flame regime, this one in the thin reaction zones regime. We can just keep both terms in the equation, and then um, we have an equation that's valid in both regimes, okay? So this now describes the evolution of the flame front in both regimes, where this propagation term is more important in the uh, corrugated flame regime. This curvature term is more important in the thin reaction zones regime, okay? So then um, uh, we can also look at the, um, uh, the, the effect here or the statistical representation of the flame. So this here is just a kind of a DNS equation, an equation that describes the, the local instantaneous evolution of the flame. Now we can look at the statistical representation. And for that, uh, this here shows um, from um, an experiment. So this here is um, uh, what's called... Um, 
uh, here the low swirl burner. Low swirl burner was developed here at Lawrence Berkeley by uh, Professor Robert Chang. Uh, you have a flow here, premixed flow, that has um, very weak swirl. If you have a strong swirl, you get strong recirculation regions. Weak swirl, you don't really get recirculation regions, but you get diverging streamlines. So the velocity gets slower if you go downstream, and that stabilizes the flame. And because you don't have strong recirculation regions, uh, the residence times are very short. So that's a burner that is um, supposedly uh, leads to very low uh, NOx uh, emissions. Okay, so that's the low swirl burner. But this it doesn't matter what burner it is. This just shows experiments that were done in this burner. So you get a flame here that that stabilizes like this and tries to burn into this burner here. And if we measure the um, the position here of the flame front. Uh, it kind of looks like this. So this is the actual measurement, and um, it's kind of how it looks like. So the, the probability of finding the flame here very close to the burner is zero. The probability of finding the flame uh, very far downstream is zero. But so the flame sits somewhere here, and it fluctuates, fluctuates uh, back and forth like this. So this gives the, the probability of the f um, finding the flame at a certain x. So um, I can define from this then, so I have the probability of the flame front position, I can uh, get the mean flame front position from this, and I can also get a departure of the instantaneous flame from the mean position, and we call this the flame brush thickness. Flame brush thickness uh, is then here this LF, is basically just um, the, the uh, standard deviation here, or the, the variance, um, or the LF is the square root of the variance of the flame front position. And then we want to define a G prime here as the departure um, of the flame from the, from the, uh, of, uh, the, the departure of a local position from the flame front position. And uh, if we define it like this, so here for example, this is the mean flame front position and um, uh, this is the, um, let's say, an instantaneous flame front. Then this here is the departure from the instantaneous flame front. If when I say um, G is a distance function, if I say it's a distance function, then um, uh, this would be the value of uh, G prime here. So then I can um, derive an equation here. This, is, uh, this is, was done by um, uh, Professor Peters. Uh, he derived an equation for the mean uh, of, of this uh, uh, level set function and equation for the variance. And then you see if I solve this equation here, uh, it still has a few unclosed terms, but if I solve this equation, it tells me uh, something about the mean flame front position. And then this here would tell you something about how large the fluctuations around these are, meaning um, how thick the region is over which the temperature goes here from unburned uh, to burned, or over which the, the product mass fractions um, go from unburned to burned. That's what the, this variance shows you. So um, the, what's interesting is that the, the, um, an equation like this, this is always the nice thing about uh, deriving an equation. When you have a, derive an equation for a certain quantity, uh, even if you never use that equation or never solve that equation, the terms in that equation, they tell you something about the physics. They might tell you how does it come to um, producing variance here or how does it come, uh, what, what takes variance out. So here, for example, um, what produces the variance of, or the fluctuations in the flame front position uh, is probably the turbulence, okay? Probably the eddies, they, they do this. But the question is, what makes the variance go away? Um, vari if the variance goes away, we said earlier, so for example, for mixture fraction, if the variance goes away, that's local mixing and that leads to heat release. Here, if the variance goes away, it, it basically means I burn something out. So this, if, if the flame here burns from, from right to left, this is unburned, this is burnt, then you see this front here moves normal to itself, this moves normal to itself, and this thing here will go away, so it will take out the variance and at the same time it will lead to heat release. So also here, the small scale destruction of variance leads to the heat release. So it's interesting to see 
uh, which terms are involved in this. And there, there's, there are three terms here which are of interest. Uh, this here is number one. This looks very much like the production term we had in the variance, in the, in the mixture fraction variance equation. Uh, and it's, it's related here to the mean gradient and so on. So this is just a, the turbulence uh, creating new fluctuations. And then you have two sink terms here. One we call the kinematic restoration. The other one we call the scalar dissipation. Uh, this here you see, again, it's defined as a, like a scalar dissipation. The kinematic restoration here, you see it depends on SL. It depends on the local burning velocity. And that's what I just said. You have, um, you have a front like this. You see this here is supposed to be the flame thickness. Here we are in the corrugated flame regime where the flame thickness is much smaller than the, than the um, uh, smallest eddy. Uh, and so the flame here is undisturbed. But we have here a G prime. We have a fluctuation of the flame front position. And just by burning, uh, by burning, this front will propagate normal to itself. And this area will go away. And you see also the, the fluctuations became less. So that's what we call the kinematic restoration because uh, just the kinematics of the flame front to restore the, um, uh, basically they go towards a zero variance, okay? So that is, that is this limit. And then in the uh, thin reaction zones regime where the, the flame thickness is on the order of the, uh, the small uh, turbulent eddies, then maybe the front looks like this here. And you see, so here, the progress variable is zero, here it would be one, and this here is a diffusion layer. So this here just goes away by diffusion, uh, which propagates then the front. And so uh, this, is, uh, this is a diffusive um, uh, scalar dissipation rate. Okay, so, so both of these, so one is more, so this is two dissipation terms, one is more important than the corrugated flame regime, one is more important than the thin reaction zones regime. Both are modeled um, together, as, a, as a, a dissipation term here, and that gives then um, uh, the, an equation here for the, um, uh, for the variance. Uh, in the um, uh, equation for the, uh, here for the mean um, uh, G field, uh, there's still a, a term like this. This is a propagation term, and this is modeled by a turbulent burning velocity. So this here is, is the, is the uh, is something like, so this is the flame surface area ratio, is something like the flame surface density, and so this is modeled as a turbulent burning velocity. If we plug this in here, then you see we get uh, two terms again. Uh, you know, as we said earlier, one related to the curvature and one related to propagation. And then this is what we talked about earlier, then the turbulent, so this here is not closed, until I have a model for the turbulent burning velocity, uh, the burning velocity we had, we had looked at uh, before. And we had a model that describes, as we said, describes both of uh, Namkula's limit, large scale and small scale turbulence. So then, um, so then we have two equations that we can solve. And the result of this is, again, uh, the equations tell us where's the mean flame front position. And also, what is the thickness of this flame brush over which the temperature goes from unburned to burnt? And then um, we can assume here a PDF of, the, uh, of G. The PDF of G should here be just Gaussian to say um, there's a Gaussian distribution to find the flame front here. Uh, is this right or not? We can look at the experiment here again. And you see, well, it kind of looks Gaussian. Not exactly Gaussian. You see it is a little skewed uh, in, in one direction. That's, that's, that's actually uh, a very common. I mean, that's a very, typical, uh, um, that's a very typical PDF that it's always a little skewed uh, to one direction. But, but we still assume it's roughly Gaussian. And then um, we get a PDF of G as function of the mean and the variance. We have solved uh, two equations for these, so these are known. Uh, so we know the PDF, and once we know the PDF, uh, we know um, 
the, the temperature as function of, the, of G, which we just take from a, from a laminar premix flame, then we can evaluate uh, here the, um, uh, the mean temperature, okay? So, so that, that's almost a trivial uh, step here uh, at the end once we know, uh, have solved these two. Um, this here shows an application, this is from a long time ago, uh, shows an application in RANS of this model. Uh, let's see, this here is an instantaneous, this is a, um, a turbulent Bunsen flame, and this is the instantaneous temperature. This is instantaneous um, OH uh, lift uh, or OH, let's say, um, mass fraction or proportional to the mass fraction or concentration. And, um, and then you take many, many of these images and take the average, then this is the, this is the result from the experiment. And then if you look at, um, if you look here at, uh, so this, this is OH, and then if you look at just the flame front position, this is the mean flame front position here from the experiment, uh, from, the, from the simulation, then, um, so both of, sorry, so both of these here are from simulation. This is from the experiment, and then you see, actually this, uh, this Bunsen cone here, uh, that is quite similar, so that this means the, the mean uh, burning velocity is, is roughly, uh, turbulent burning velocity is roughly the same, uh, but there are obvious differences. I mean, you see here, this is the flame front position. This here is evaluated from the experiment. Maybe also the experiment has some uncertainties, but you see the model here also um, has some uncertainties. And, and uh, one, one of uh, the students asked during the, the lunch discussion we had, can I also show bad results? Yes, you see, you can also show bad results. <laughs> One should never uh, hide bad results, but just show, because that always gives uh, others the opportunity to do new research, okay? So, but, but as I said, these are uh, kind of old results. Um, also, the, the, these are kind of old results. We have, um, uh, meanwhile, we have used these methods, and we have formulated them for LES. Uh, in LES, the whole averaging is a little more complicated uh, than what I just showed you. Um, we went through uh, two or three generations of, of different ways of doing this. The first one, we used exactly the same uh, methodology we have, we have used in RANS, and it turns out that's, that's not exactly right for LES. Then uh, we had um, defined a new filter and you gave really nice results, but, but theoretically also we realized it was uh, not exactly right. And then uh, here with my student, Edward Knudsen, um, here 2008, so maybe 10 years ago, uh, then we, we really came up with a, a, a really good method for how to um, define the level set and how to do the averaging and so on. And this maybe we shouldn't go through uh, the details here, but if you are interested in this uh, level set uh, formulation, and you're interested in um, uh, you're interested in LES, then make sure you go to this latest version because that's the that's the right version. Actually, it also shows that uh, in RANS also the RANS formulation also should be updated because this the way we we defined the average here, uh, the the level set here is uh, is 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 actually better and. Um, uh, one could do the same thing for RANS also, which we haven't done uh, yet, but which could be done. So this here, you see this all, uh, so the way, the way we do this here is we, we say, let's say you have a temperature field or you have a, a progress variable that, let's say, kind of looks like this, okay? It's a turbulent field, progress variable, as function of X, and then um, we want to say uh, there's some flame front position somewhere, we said earlier, Maybe we just take the, here the, the T naught uh, isosurface, and that's what we want to track. Now, if I define a level set uh, function uh, based here on, on this position, uh, it mathematically it's not exactly right then uh, to just average this field. Because we said earlier, um, the level set function, what it does is it says where, where G is zero, that, that's where the the flame or this flame or this isosurface is, 
but, but the rest is kind of arbitrary. I mean, we could define it as a distance function. We could define it as a distance function in the unburned, twice the distance function in the burned. We could define it as um, whatever. I mean, it's, um, it's arbitrary. And because it's arbitrary, if you just take the mean of this arbitrary field, if you take the average of the arbitrary field, also the average is arbitrary, okay? In order to define the, the, the mean flame front position, one should not use the entire field, but only the position at the flame itself, okay? Because that's the only, that's the only truth that this level set field has. So what we did here was we say, okay, let's say this is the flame front position, then we define a heavy side function goes like this, and that heavy side function gives us a field that looks very much like the Proclus variable. In the limit of the thin reaction zones regime, the Proclus variable actually it is a heavy side function, okay? Infinitely thin. In the in limit of the thin reaction zones regime, um, it's an approximation to the Proclus variable. Um, but, but it's not the Proclus variable, but it's an, it's an arbitrarily defined heavy side function at the location of the flame surface. And then we take this heavy side function and we filter that. And that heavy side function uh, is shown here, a uh, heavy side function at this position C0. And we can derive an equation for this. And then we can, and that equation then we can, we can apply a filter to. That's mathematically well, uh, well um, defined. And then uh, we have the filtered field and we can define a new level set function that then uh, describes the filtered field. So um, that's what I said earlier here, doing math with heavy side functions and delta functions is difficult. So here, this, in this case, actually we assume this here to be an error function and this here is a Gaussian, okay? Uh, with with um, the width goes to zero uh, for both of these and then uh, the math is continuous and it's much, much easier to do this. So this is all described here. Uh, ultimately, this is the equation. The equation looks very similar, but um, so, so you could say it doesn't really matter too much. But if we want to define dynamic models, then the actual filtering operations uh, in LES, they are very important. And so for, for defining dynamic models, then uh, it, the, the, this formalism uh, of how to do the filtering is very important. This here shows an application again. Uh, this here is uh, a, a LES now of a Bunsen flame. You see the temperature here on top. This is a, this is a pilot flame here, uh, which, is next to the, um, which is next to the jet. There's a premixed jet coming in and the gray, the gray uh, surface here is the flame surface. And then here we have the velocity and you see that just at the flame front, you get a strong acceleration here. Uh, and then you get mixing here with the surrounding gases. Uh, this shows a comparison of the temperature uh, very close to the nozzle with experiments. Uh, this here is the um, axial velocity. And you see the results are not so bad. What's interesting is the, the blue here is the, um, that's the non-reactive mixture. So they also did uh, velocity measurements uh, in the non-reactive mixture and then exactly same conditions but, but with a flame on. And you see you get an acceleration here uh, which, which is kind of captured by the model. And then here, this is a different case. or oh, this is further downstream. Yeah, this is further downstream. Then more has burned, more acceleration, and the model still kind of captures this uh, all right. Uh, this is the interesting part. Uh, this is the kinetic energy. Turbulent kinetic energy. And for the non-reactive case is here, the blue. And once they turn on the flame, the kinetic energy goes down by a factor of three or four, okay? So heat release very strongly attenuates the kinetic energy. It's very important to capture this effect. And you see that uh, the model here is not perfect, but, but uh, it, it captures this strong attenuation uh, to some degree. Then also, uh, one thing we did, we um, uh, defined a new regime diagram, which I think is very uh, helpful, is very interesting. Uh, remember the Borghi regime diagram, uh, the, the so-called Borghi diagram, 
it had u prime over SL as function of L divided by uh, LF, LT divided by LF. Both of these are physical parameters, which you can uh, vary independently. Uh, in LES, uh, we also have a numerical parameter, which, which, um, which you can choose independently. It's, it's just numerics, and that is the filter size. So the filter size could be very, very small so that you resolve the flame, that you resolve even the, the, uh, the reaction zone, and then you would be doing a DNS, okay? At least for the scalar, maybe not for the velocity field. Um, at the same time, then the question, so here this shows um, delta over LF, the filter size over LF on one axis, and on the other axis, uh, it shows the Karlowitz number because the Karlowitz number, we said, that's really the only really important parameter. And it's, it combines the effects here of uh, U prime over SL and LF over, over delta. And so uh, this, so you could, you could look at this diagram as in this direction, you change the physics. That's what you change in an experiment, okay? And then in this direction here, you don't change the physics, you just change a numerical parameter. Okay, changing the, the, the a, a parameter in your code cannot change the physics, right? It should not change the physics. And, and one thing that's very important also is that a model, no matter what the model is, the model should never um, bring the, the physical point to a, different, um, to a different regime, okay? It should always keep the, or capture the physics in one regime. So then, here's the Karlovitz number equal to one line. Here's Karlovitz delta equal to one. This thin reaction zones regime, broken reaction zone, and so on. Corrugated flame regime. And you see here, this is uh, delta equal to eta, meaning if, if delta is smaller than the green line here, that means for the turbulence now you're doing a DNS. But the flame in this regime here is still smaller than, than, de than eta. And so for the chemistry, you're not doing a DNS here. So this regime resol resolved the turbulence, uh, but not, not the, the scalar fields. Here we also resolved the scalar fields. Uh, then this here, is the, this here is a line, this Damkohler number equal to one, uh, subfilter Damkohler number equal to one. In this regime here, the filter is larger than the, the flame thickness. And in this regime here, we partly resolve actually the, the flame thickness, which is now broadened by the turbulence, okay? So you have in, in the thin reaction zones regime, the preheat region is broadened, and then uh, we have, um, we have, uh, uh, we have a turbulence actually entering the, um, uh, this region. Okay, so that, that is an example here. Yes? This is Reynolds equal to one, yes. right? The, the yeah, so, so DNS is here and here, right? Why is the resolved? Here? Yeah, yeah, because here the turbulence is resolved, but not the reaction zone, okay? So the reaction zone is smaller in this regime. The reaction zone is smaller than eta, which means you can resolve eta, but, but not the reaction zone. Right. And then, if you make it even finer, this also resolves reaction zone, and then this would be uh, DNS. Okay? So, okay. So then I said earlier, um, my advisor always said, um, uh, non previous combustion is easy, so uh, we can do this um, relatively quickly here. Uh, most of this is just a summary of what we, uh, what we talked about before. We defined the mixture fraction, this is just another way of uh, defining the mixture fraction, the coupling function here uh, from, from these equations, uh, but we have defined the mixture fraction already. Um, it is uh, zero in the air and one in the fuel. And here comes the, here co already comes the modeling. Um, if, I, let's say, this is how we model, uh, often model non premix combustion. If I know the PDF of mixture fraction, we said mixture fraction, that's the most important parameter. If I know the PDF of mixture fraction um, and I know 
the scalars as function of mixer fraction, then I can just get the mean quantity here by integrating this, uh, this function, okay? So, um, uh, the scalars as function of mixer fraction, uh, we know these already, for example, in the limit of infinitely fast chemistry, we said is the book Schumann limit, and in the first lecture on Monday, uh, we derived expression for mass fractions as function of mixture fraction. So in the book Schumann limit, we already know uh, these functions, for example. Then the question is about um, the PDF. PDFs can be often very complicated, and how should we model this? Um, the nice thing about the mixture fraction is it's not influenced by chemistry. It does the chemical, the transport equation does not have a chemical source term. So this is nothing else than a diffusive scalar. And two diffusive scalars, I said earlier, uh, many processes like this in, in, in nature, which don't have anything special like a chemical source term, they are described by a Gauss, Gaussian distribution, by a normal distribution. So um, the, um, the um, uh, mixture fraction, we could, let's, let's think of describing this just by a Gaussian distribution, normal distribution. Normal distribution has two parameters, the mean and the standard deviation, or the mean and the variance, okay? And so we need equations for these. There's an equation for the mean, there's an equation for the variance, and we, we already derived these uh, equations earlier. We, we also had closure for the individual terms. And so both of these equations, they are they are, we have these now, we have closed these and we can solve these, okay? So from this, I could uh, determine my, um, my uh, normal distribution. Now, what's the problem with a normal distribution? The normal distribution uh, goes from minus infinity to infinity. It gives you always non-zero probability of finding a value of minus 10,000, okay? But the, the mixture fraction is bounded between zero and one. It cannot be larger than one, cannot be smaller than zero. So the Gaussian is kind of complicated there. In the old days, people used clipped Gaussian. So what they did was this. They just said, okay, this is my, um, let's say, you know, this is the mean, and then this is the standard deviation, and then I get something that kind of looks like this, okay? That would be my Gaussian, but really this Gaussian, it goes like this, and it goes like this, and I just clip it off here. And I take this area and this area, and just multiply this here, that is a little larger to consider this area. That's called a clipped Gaussian, but it's, you know, it's, it's not very satisfying, it's not very accurate. So then, um, that, so that's problem number one. And problem number two is that if I have uh, fuel and air initially unmixed. Okay, that's usually you have a nozzle and, and you have air around it, and when it comes in, I have either pure fuel or pure air. So I get these delta functions. If I, if I do a measurement just downstream of the nozzle, I will only measure pure fuel. So that, that, at that point, the PDF should be a delta function at pure fuel. And, and if I do a, a measurement w far away from the nozzle, um, then I should, I measure only pure air, it gives me the delta function of pure air. So that also the, uh, the Gaussian here has a hard time uh, showing this, especially if you, if, if you have a region where uh, pure fuel and pure air just wobble around like this and, and you measure just pure fuel and pure air. So, so that's what the beta function does. The beta function has, two pro has uh, some nice properties. Um, the beta function for large variance, it gives you a double delta function at zero and one. So it can treat this case where you only have pure fuel and only pure air um, and, and nothing is mixed yet, okay? That's one limit it has. And if the, if the standard deviation or the variance gets very, very small, then it goes to a Gaussian distribution, okay? It, it, it approaches a Gaussian distribution. So this is kind of a Gaussian distribution for a value for a quantity that varies between zero and one. And you see a few of these, um, you see here how, so this is the functional form. It relies on this gamma function and these alpha-beta parameters. Alpha and beta are determined here from 
uh, from, from the mean and the variance. So if you know the mean and the variance, you can compute this gamma, the beta, and the alpha, and then you can uh, determine this function. And so you see this here, this here is one that has a smaller uh, variance for larger variance than this thing flips, and you get something like this. So this here is the double delta, this approach is a double delta function, and then um, here we have one that has a lot of fuel, but, uh, and, and just a little bit of air, okay? So uh, this, this function can um, represent all of these limits, so that's, that's the nice thing. Represents the Gaussian at the end, uh, towards the end of mixing, where everything's almost um, well mixed, and it gives you these double delta functions. So, so if I look back at this, so now I have a, a PDF here of mixture fraction, and all that's missing now is the value of the scalars as, as function of mixture fraction. Let's look at how we can do this, and there are different assumptions here I can make. Um, and a few of these we discussed already. So, for example, I can assume infinitely fast, irreversible chemistry. If I do this, call this the book Schumann uh, limit, then I have, um, as I said on the first day, look at your lecture notes, we had uh, mass fractions as function of mixture fraction, also temperature as function of mixture fraction. And so now I know the PDF, I know these functions, and I can value, evaluate the mean uh, at any given point. The other assumption would be infinitely fast reversible chemistry. That's what we call chemical equilibrium. We also, I also showed you how to compute chemical equilibrium. Um, I also said equilibrium is a good assumption for hydrogen. Sometimes, you know, if, if things are, are, are um, fast, if the uh, turbulence is not too strong and you're in the high dumpkula number limit, then um, that would be, uh, uh, is good for hydrogen. It's also good for hydrocarbons on the lean side. It's not good for hydrocarbons on the rich side, okay? So one has to be careful with that. And uh, so, so these are uh, these two models. And then the other one is the flame lamp model. Both of these models assume infinitely fast chemistry. The flame lamp model assumes fast, but not infinitely fast chemistry. Relatively fast chemistry, where you don't get local extinction yet, and, um, but, but, uh, but you're not at equilibrium yet. And another model here is the so-called conditional moment closure model. And you see both of these, they depend not only on the mixture fraction, but also on the scalar dissipation rate. Uh, no surprise, we said earlier, the scalar dissipation rate, that is really a, a very important parameter because uh, in the limit of infinitely fast chemistry, uh, it, it, it actually is proportional to the uh, to the reaction source term, okay? Because it, it gives you the rate of molecular mixing, and for infinitely fast chemistry, that's equal to the, um, uh, to the chemical source term, okay? So now we want to look at, um, so this, this we discussed, yeah, this we discussed already, this is the, this book Schumann limit, and we want to uh, briefly uh, talk about this flame lamp model. So the um, idea here is that um, we uh, want to, uh, derive these equations, the flame equations, that give us the, um, uh, describe the limit of relatively fast chemistry, but not infinitely fast chemistry. And we have done this already. We started out with a system of equations here, temperature, mass fractions, and mixture fraction. And then uh, we replaced, so this is shown here, we introduced a coordinate system on the surface of stoichiometric mixture, and we replaced the normal, the surface normal coordinate by mixture fraction, and the other two we kept the same. Then you get here these um, uh, transformation rules. So this here shows transformation rules in a little more detail, as I showed you earlier, um, leading to this. And then we can uh, insert this in the governing equations. Uh, all this we had done before, and that gives you an equation like this. And now, you see, we get two types of terms. One term here, um, it has here the scalar dissipation rate as a coefficient, and um, it has a second derivative in mixer fraction. And then all other terms here have a derivative in Z2 or Z3, okay? So mixer fraction is normal to the flame front, Z2, Z3, 
they are tangential to the, uh, not flame front, I shouldn't say flame front. They are, um, they are normal to the um, uh, surface of stoichiometric mixture or tangential to the surface of stoichiometric mixture. And what we do then is we say um, all derivatives, so this is an asymptotic uh, approximation. We say in the limit of relatively fast chemistry, not infinitely fast chemistry, in the limit of relatively fast chemistry, these terms here, these derivatives, they are much, much smaller than this derivative, and so we can neglect all these terms. And that leads us then to the Fleming equations, which just have these three terms left. This year, it, I showed this to you earlier, but we can uh, see, you know, what, what these assumptions mean in this DNS. So here, uh, for example, maybe I can stop this at some point. Um, we can see what are the derivatives in direction of mixture fraction and so it stop here. So now if you look at um, what is the, the derivative normal to the surface of stoichiometric mixture, you see here the temperature is super high, it's, it's burnt, and here it's, it's cold, okay? So you see if I, go, if, I take a, if I take a derivative normal to this uh, surface, then the derivative is very, the value is very large, okay? I get very large gradients normal to this, but if I go along this, along this line, you see the temperature is high everywhere, okay? So if I go along this line, this would be derivatives in Z2 and Z3, then I don't get much change, okay? So that's what we assume, is that if, I, if the color here, let's say, if I go along this green line, doesn't change, it's all yellow, but if I go across this, then I get strong changes. That's the assumption. And that assumption actually is pretty good, as long as I don't have this happening here. You see, here I have local extinction, I go along the green line. If I go along the green line, you see all of a sudden here, uh, the temperature change along this line gets large. Also here or, or here in other places. Um, so as long as I don't have things like um, local extinction, these assumptions are good. I'll show you later that, that even if you have local extinction, it doesn't mean you can't use this model. Uh, we have used this also with local extinction. Then one ha just has to uh, treat these uh, things a little differently. Okay, the scalar patient, I mentioned this, uh, is a parameter here. These are unsteady equations, and I can solve these equations now in an unsteady way, or I can, so I can assume that the flame structure is in steady state, and then I neglect this, and then um, I get just the steady state solutions to these equations. These are the steady state solutions, and, and basically what's done very often is one assumes this is uh, the, the, the unsteady term is zero, the flame structure is in steady state, then you see I can solve this equation by, by fixing this parameter. I can solve this for all possible values of the dissipation rate. Uh, I tabulate this as function of the dissipation rate. And then in a simulation, in a CFT simulation, in a cell, I locally I evaluate, the, I have a model for the scalar dissipation, I evaluate the scalar dissipation rate, and I go in the table, and I pick the value, um, uh, the, the flamelet for that given scalar patient rate. That's a, that's a very simple uh, a model that's, that's relatively simple to implement and um, uh, it's, it's used a lot. I sh I'll show you some uh, results from that model. These, the, the, you know, how this describes the extinction, all this, we discussed this before. And then here um, I can say, so if so this is this uh, so-called steady state flame model. If I assume um, the, the flame structures in steady state, I can solve these equations, I can tabulate them, and then um, uh, locally, I, in, in one cell, I can evaluate the, scalar, the value of the scalar spatial rate, the mean uh, mixture fraction and the variance of the mixture fraction. If I have these three quantities, I know the PDF and uh, I know this function, and I can evaluate this integral. And usually, uh, the tabulation, the tables, they even have this integral already evaluated. So for each given value of scalar spatial rate and um, mean and variance of mixer fraction, I can integrate this, and I get a value here 
uh, for the mean temperature, mean uh, CO2 mass fractions, and so on. And so this means I can tabulate the mean quantities as function of the mean mixer fraction, the mixer fraction variance, and the um, scalar dissipation rate. Okay, so so that's uh, that's um, that's a model that um, is uh, is sometimes used. This just shows how to uh, evaluate the um, uh, the scalar dissipation, the local value of the scalar dissipation rate. So here for this for the here for this uh, the mean value of the scalar dissipation rate, we have a model which we introduced uh, yesterday. Uh, I can evaluate this, so I know the mean dissipation rate. I want to know the stoichiometric value, and this just shows you how to do this. Um, maybe we'll skip over this. Another way uh, to solve the flame equations is to not assume that the flame structure is in steady state, but solve the unsteady equations. And I can do this uh, by, for example, uh, with this uh, representative uh, flame lamp model, uh, which we developed a long time ago for, uh, for doing simulations of diesel engines. So in the diesel engine, the process is not steady state. So things change all the time. You have ignition and the pressure changes and all this. So, so because of this, one cannot assume that the flame structure is in steady state. And so what we do here is, uh, and that's the, that's the trick, we assume there's only one flamelet, but that is representative for the entire cylinder, for everything that happens in the cylinder. And so we have a CFD code. At the time, it was the Kiva code. And then um, in each cell here, we determine the dissipation rate and the pressure. And then we solve the flamelet code for a time step. From this, we get this function. Um, from the CFD code here, we have mean and variance of, of mixer fraction, which gives us the PDF. And then we can evaluate all the mean quantities. From that, we get the mean temperature. And we can do a new time step here with the CFD code now because now we know the temperature. And once we did this, we do time step for this. So it goes back and forth. And um, uh, this here then shows, for example, the temperature as function of time uh, in the flamelet. And you see here in the beginning, um, in the beginning, in a diesel engine, you, comp you have compressed air. The temperature of the air is very high here, maybe more than 1,000 Kelvin. And then here, that's the fuel. So the temperature of the fuel is low. Fuel is injected and starts mixing. But in the beginning here, the temperature is low. Then you see here, um, stoichiometric condition is 0.06. You see here on the rich side, ignition starts. Uh, this point here then is ignited. Then the high temperature it proceeds throughout the entire mixer fraction space. And after some time, uh, you get high temperature here at stoichiometry. Okay, so this is, this is how this describes the, um, uh, the ignition process. This here is actually an old simulation. This is the first simulation we have done uh, by this. This shows the same thing here. This is the temperature distribution in the beginning as, as function of uh, degrees crank angle in the, in the engine. And you see here again, you get, um, you get uh, ignition here, actually two-stage ignition. First stage here. Uh, in the rich part of the flame, then ignition happens here, the rich part, and then very quickly uh, the whole uh, mixer fraction space is ignited, and then um, you see the maximum temperature goes down because of the expansion of the cylinder. This shows, um, now we said um, uh, earlier that, for example, things like NOx and soot, they never reach equilibrium. You have to compute kind of or describe the 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 fact that these are slow processes. And that's what we can do now also in this model because we solve the chemistry as function of time. We also see that, for example, you get very fast, you get ignition, but then the temperature increases only very slowly. Uh, the, sorry, the NO concentration increases very slowly. Soot concentration here increases very slowly. So here we did a variation in, uh, in exhaust gas recirculation rate. You, get hi you do higher EGR in a diesel engine, you get less NOx, but you get more soot. And so here you have the experiments in blue, uh, the simulations in, uh, in red, and you see NOx actually is predicted very well. Uh, soot here is over-predicted by uh, maybe 30% here, even more, but, um, but the trend is, is not so bad. Soot is complex. Um, 
This here shows, as I said earlier, the Magnussen model uh, or the eddy breakup model. Um, that, that actually uh, leads to too high temperatures. We compared this here with the experiment, and that's what we saw. Um, you see here, um, using these simple models here for soot, for example, gives you even the wrong trend. Uh, for NOx, actually, is not so bad. Um, the other thing that's very nice, what we can do here, is we can um, uh, look at, we can evaluate, so because all of this is based on detailed chemistry, we can evaluate the different NOx formation pathway as function of time. So you see here, this is thermal NOx as function of time in the engine. Um, it shows that most of the NOx here comes from thermal NOx. Uh, this is prompt and this is reburn. And you see that if you would only consider thermal NOx, uh, reburn and prompt, they actually have an effect, but they almost cancel out, okay? So you, 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 you almost get the, the right result. And, and this is also interesting. Um, uh, this shows soot as function of time or function of crank angle here in the cylinder. And this is where the exhaust valve opens. And what you see is in an engine, you almost form a, you always form a lot of soot. And then uh, most of the soot, maybe 95%, will be oxidized before the valve opens, okay? So if the, if, the, if the mixing is not so good, this will not happen, and you will have a lot of, uh, lot of emissions. Okay, maybe I'll skip over this. These are some uh, newer uh, simulations we have done uh, here for uh, what's called PCCI, partially premixed, uh, premixed charge compression ignition uh, engines, um, where uh, one issue is hydrocarbon emissions. Uh, which actually we, we were able to predict quite well. Um, this, this is um, a case where we extended these models for multiple injections. If you have on not only one injection, you have an injection, and then sometime later you have a second injection. That's a, that's a strategy that's used often in engines. Uh, if you have that, then in a way, the first fuel um, is one fuel, and the second one comes in as a different fuel. So now... We said mixture fraction is always good if you have two different streams. But now we have three streams. We have the air, the first fuel, and the second fuel. And so uh, we have multidimensional uh, flamelet equations here uh, which describe all this mixing. And um, this just shows an application. Then here, of a, you see here, let me just show you the injection process here. Uh, first injection, sub second injection, okay? First injection start burning. That's a technology that's used for uh, reducing noise. Uh, if you inject a little bit and starts reacting, and then you insect, inject the second part, then the the noise uh, uh, you get a lot less noise uh, in the engine. You get multiple heat release here. Let me see. Uh, is anything uh, uh, interesting left here? This is an application. Let me let me finish with this. Steady state flame lamp model, I said this earlier, we assume this to be zero. We just tabulate uh, these things here. And I want to show you what the model is, uh, is uh, uh, capable of doing. Uh, this here is a, a test case that was also used in this uh, turbulent non premix flame workshop. Some of you have heard of this. Uh, this is a very nice workshop where, where the, the best uh, laser diagnostics people in the world they do a very, very complex um, measurements in, in certain flames uh, and do it in a way that everything is well characterized. And then um, these are then standard test cases. And then everyone who does modeling tries to do simulations using their models for the same case. And then by comparing all the simulations, we learn a lot about what one metal can do better than the other uh, and, and what's still needed and things like this. So this is a case. Uh, this is a bluff body stabilized flame where you have, you see the little black spot here in the center? That's actually the fuel nozzle. So that's where the fuel nozzle comes. And the white surface here, that's just a, a, a bluff body. It's just a body, and then the air comes around this, so you get recirculation regions here and so on. And this is a case where a lot of people have tried to do um, RAN simulations, and the RAN simulations, usually they had really good results here, but bad results there, or vice versa, depending on how they tune their models. And this one here, I think, this is also quite old, but it was the first simulation that, uh, the, the first uh, real LES simulation of this case. Uh, this is a little hard to see now, 
but this is, um, maybe this is too hard to see, but, but you see a lot of dynamics here in this flame. Uh, you see that you get shear layers here on the side. These shear layers, they're very stable, but once in a while they break down, they lead to a lot of mixing. And that is something that, um, that RAN simulation just couldn't, um, just couldn't capture. And so, um, let me see the time, are we over time already? Yeah. So, so this shows the um, results then. This is temperature and this is CO mass fraction and this is close to the, no close to the nozzle and this is further downstream. And you see all, you know, is, uh, this, this simulation captures both of these. And it captures both of these because it's, it, it, it um, can um, consider this rare event of very strong mixing, which in RANs you have no chance of capturing. So this really shows the advantage of using LES. So, so then uh, we also looked at these flames again, but um, uh, I'll stop here. So, th so there's one more section here, applications. I never uh, do, I, this is the sixth time I've done this, I've never had the time to cover this last one. Also, I'm always a little behind, but uh, I hope uh, this was not too fast and I could give you, um, uh, I could give you an overview of, uh, you know, how, uh, or an idea for how we do modeling. There are a lot more details um, uh, related to modeling uh, which, which, which are impossible to cover uh, in this one week, but uh, this should give you a starting point. So, uh, yes, you have a question. I wanted to ask you what the workshop you mentioned was. Was that? The workshop Yes, what that workshop is? It's called TNF Workshop, Turbulent non premix Flame Workshop. It's a workshop that's always uh, the week before the combustion symposium is coming up. Uh, very nice. There are a lot of workshops, uh, and, and if you have the chance, uh, try to go to some of these workshops. Uh, these workshops, by the way, you, you're young. Uh, the workshops always give you um, a podium. You have a, done a simulation for a case. The workshops give you a podium. People see what you have done, and uh, it's a very nice way to... Uh, get, get your stuff known to, uh, uh, to everyone. So uh, let me stop here. Let me thank you again for always uh, coming to the class, for always uh, being attentive, uh, asking questions, and uh, being interested in all this stuff. Uh, I enjoyed this. I'm glad it's over now, <laughs> but I, I enjoyed it. I will go home uh, later this afternoon. So um, uh, I wish you a good rest of the workshop here, or of the summer school, and wish you... Uh, safe travels back home and uh, hope to see you in uh, some upcoming uh, conferences. Okay. <laughs>